Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode one of season two of Dirt Nap City. It's 2023. I'm here with Alex, and we're ready to jump into it, literally. How are you today, Alex? I'm doing great. Can't wait to get started on season two. Yes, yeah, season one was amazing. I really appreciate all the people that downloaded the episodes, all the people that commented. Don't forget, you can always email us at not at dirtnap city. And if you think about the at as the word at, then it'll make sense. Not at dirtnap city. If you want to let us know how you like the episodes, and of course, Alex at dirtnap city and Kelly at dirtnap city. If you want to say something bad about one of us, just probably want to say that to the other person, right? I'm getting tons of emails like that. Season two, we're really going to explore some interesting people. Alex and I did a strategy session last night, spent a couple of hours, um, and really thought about how deep we could go with these people. It's my intention to spend more than 15 minutes per person uh, doing research so that we can really go deep, and also to pick people that you have heard of but are not necessarily famous. And you know, we both realized if they're too famous, like a biopic has been made about them, they're not as uh, likely to be interesting to you. I think that's the lane that we want to stay in is people that have a uh, good, uh, what do you call it? Q ratings? Is that what Q, the, the yeah, term is? Q, Q ratings. Uh, people that everybody's heard of, but they're not quite, uh, they haven't made the level of making a movie about. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, that the person I picked for this episode, and this is going to be a uh, Kelly picked it episode, is fits right into that category. And so why don't I start, Alex, by giving you a couple of clues? Well, first of all, can I ask you this? You said earlier that we're going to jump right into it, literally. Does that have anything to do with who you picked? <laughs> it does. <laughs> so, see, I'm perceptive. I caught that. Yes, yes. And just so everyone knows... Alex does not know who this episode is about yet, even though it was on the thumbnail when you're listening to it. He know he knows when you're listening to it, but as we're recording it, he doesn't know. So go ahead. Do you want to guess? Well, if I, if I guessed Eddie Van Halen, would I be right? Oh, that's a great guess, but no. Oh, wouldn't that be? W would you rather have me guess right away? Then give me the the clues that you've thought of. Well, I just thought you would be a real badass if you guessed it right out of the gate. And Eddie Van Halen is a very, very good uh, guess with jump right into it. But um, yeah, I mean, literally, yeah, there, there's, there's a connection there for sure. Let me tell you, this person is a bit older or was a bit older than Eddie Van Halen. He was born in 1829 and died in 1909. He was known sort of to be a villain, not sort of to be, definitely to be a villain and a savage in early life. People people uh, thought very poorly of him, at least Americans did. But then later in life, he actually became kind of a celebrity and was uh, got to meet some very famous people and traveled around and people would pay just to meet him or touch him later in life. Hmm. This is intriguing. I don't have a guess. His name uh, is a one word name and it's very famous. <laughs> mm. Died in 1909. Died in 1909. At the age of 79. He really, you know, for that time period, that's pretty old. So somebody that was old in the 19th century that went by one name with jump in the clue. Yeah. Was he an American guy? Yeah, very much so. Man, I'm not. Do you have any other clues for me? Well, his name is something that is very much associated with jumping. Hmm. It might be something you would shout as you jumped. <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm, I'm really clueless yeah what do people what do what do paratroopers say when they jump out of airplanes oh geronimo yes oh i see the jump thing so yeah. geronimo geronimo that per that's perfect that's right in the wheelhouse of what we're talking about i would love to learn about geronimo today excellent so you didn't pick geronimo for yours i did not <laughs> okay good good because uh you know, we were pretty worried that was going to happen right out of the gate. If you didn't hear our Dr. Seuss episode, go back and listen to that because we both picked Dr. Seuss at the same time and it was pretty funny. But yes, Geronimo, he was born, uh, like I said, in 1829 
there's a lot of Native American names in this that I, some of them I put in and some of them I left out because I just couldn't even pronounce them and it got really complicated. But I tried to, I tried to be as um, accurate as possible with the actual tribe names and because his name was not actually pronounced Geronimo until later. That was sort of a um, change in the way that people said it. But the literal meaning of the word is one who yawns. <laughs> well, that's an odd. Uh, that's an odd thing to be named. I, I, I think a lot of Native American names are are a lot more poetic than that. Uh, yeah. yeah. One well, who yawns. One who yawns. Yes. Um, he was a prominent leader and a medicine man. So one interesting thing is a lot of people think he was a chief. He wasn't actually a chief. He was a medicine man of the. All right, I'm going to try and say this correctly. Of the Bedankoa, the Bedankoa band of the Apache. So, just real quick, Apache is not really a single tribe of Native Americans. It's a collection of culturally related tribes that were in sort of the same region that simplified the way that, um, you know, Americans, as in U.S. Americans, because when you ask me if he was American, yes, he was more American than than most of the people there at the time. Um, but you, you know, the people from the United States uh, sort of simplified a bunch of tribes by calling them Apache because they were all in one region. So to say that you're an Apache um, isn't very specific to the actual tribe. So he was part of the Bedankoa, and he was a medicine man, and from most famously for 36 years from 1850 until 1886, he joined members of three other Apache bands to carry out raids on both Mexican and U.S. campaigns in northern Mexico. So basically, there was this whole mess of things going on at the time. There was uh, the U.S. military. There was the Mexican settlers and Mexican military. And then there was the Apache and the other Native Americans, and they were all kind of at war with each other, right? The U.S. Um, was at war with Mexico for a long time, and then the Apache was at war with both Mexico and the U.S. for a long time. And what region do we know now? Is this what used to be northern Mexico and is now like Arizona and Texas? Chihuahua, Sonora, New Mexico, and Arizona. Yep. Okay. Um, so, so kind of northern... Present day northern Mexico, but also um, also southern southwest United States. So kind okay. of that whole region. You know, at the time there was no real dividing line. It was all right. under under um, a lot of duress and a lot of protest about who actually claimed it. And so as the United States was expanding westward, Mexico already had settlers out there, and then the Native Americans were out there, and so everybody was just at each other's throat um, trying to take over. So. Um, Geronimo was known, was famous for leading uh, Apache Native Americans into these battles and fighting people. And I shouldn't say battles, actually, they were more like raids. So they would go in and try to disrupt and remove people from this area, scare them, right? Kill them or scare them away was their goal. What happened in 1835, Mexico placed a bounty on Apache scalps. So basically they would pay you if you brought back an Apache scalp. Um, and then two years later, a guy named Mangus Coloradus became the principal chief and leader and began a series of raids against the Mexicans. And the Apache raids on the Mexicans were so numerous and brutal that between 1820 and 1835, over 5,000 Mexicans died from Apache raids and over 100 settlements were destroyed. I can't even get my head around like this, um, just what was going on at that time with the, the three kind of the three way fighting and um, pretty intense out there. And this guy, uh, Mangus, I don't know if it's Mangus or Mangus, but uh, Colorado, which sounds a lot like Colorado. Maybe there's an association there. He was the chief. He was kind of the guy in charge of all this. And so again, Geronimo was not a chief. He was a medicine man. He was only part of one small tribe, um, the bed on Koa. And he was uh, just famous for doing these raids. So he would take out a band of 30 to 50 of his tribe members or maybe a group of other Apache tribe members and do these raids. Part of the reason that Geronimo was really into this and passionate about these raids is because he felt, much like many Native Americans, that reservation life was confining and they didn't want to be stuck on these little plots of land that they 
had an ass to be stuck on because they were very nomadic people, right? So ultimately, this was a big insult and a big change of their way of life. And so a lot of these raids were because he felt like his land that had been his, you know, his ancestors land. And I don't think Native Americans really thought of it as their land, but the land that they had once roamed freely on was being taken over by the U.S. and Mexico. Yeah, I think that was the whole point is that land doesn't belong to anybody. Yes. And so he would actually um, lead what they called breakouts from the reservations in order to try and dissuade the Mexicans and the United States from settling and also just to be able to go back to their nomadic lifestyle that they had always known before that. The bounty on Apache scalps was put on their head in, in by Mexico in 1835. Geronimo really started his raids in 1850. So there had been a lot of conflict going on for a long time when he started the raids. And he really had several periods. He got captured several times. He escaped several times. And his most famous period of conflict was between 1876 and 1850. 86 for about 10 years. Again, he was often mistaken as a chief, even though he was really a shaman. And that was because he was just good at leading people. But he led a breakout from the reservation in 1885 and was pursued by American forces and finally surrendered to a guy named Charles Gatewood in 1886. Um, Geronimo and 27 Apaches were captured and exiled to Florida. And one of the things I found interesting is Charles Gatewood was known to the Apache as Bay Chen Densen, which means long nose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so again, captured for the third and final time in 1886. And when he surrendered, uh, interestingly too, he was in possession of several um, U.S. made uh, weapons. He had a Winchester model 1876 lever action rifle that was actually pretty fancy and is now actually on display in West Point, New York at the Military Academy. He had a Colt single action army revolver with nickel finish and ivory stocks. And he had a Bowie knife that was uh, pretty um, fancy as well. And those things, the Bowie knife and the single action revolver are on display at the Fort Sill Museum in Oklahoma. So was he known at this time to other than military people? Was he kind of a, a, did people know about him? Yes and no. People in this region, I think he had a very ferocious reputation, right? Because um, his name became synonymous with these raids because he led them. I don't think he was famous across the Eastern United States yet. That came later in life. Um, but when he surrendered, there was a lot of debate because he said that he surrendered conditionally, meaning that there were conditions that he would surrender and you know he would have to be allowed certain things. Whereas the general who testified uh, before, actually before Congress, said that uh, it was unconditional surrender because he was a dangerous outlaw and he didn't have any choice in the matter. So he and his men surrendered and were taken captive. They were taken to Florida eventually, but um, according to National Geographic magazine, during the last five months of Geronimo's career, his band of 16 warriors, I guess that was who, how many were you know, known to be traveling around and doing these raids, had slaughtered more than 500 or 600 Mexicans. And he became the most famous Native American at the time, earning him the title of worst Indian that ever lived. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I can't get a sense of when people, like you say, in the Eastern United States are just like just going on that weren't part of any of these skirmishes and or settlements, uh, settlements um, were were these people legendary or was it way later that they started hearing about them? So so they were legendary, like you said, among the Western uh, United States settlers, people out in the plains and the military, of course. But no, they be he became more legendary across the entire United States later. And I'm going to tell you about that in a second. It's, it's noted that he and his group were one of the very last groups to surrender, to, to basically stop fighting these wars and stop doing these raids. You know, he was known as, as kind of the last person or one of the last people, Native Americans, to refuse to accept the United States occupation of the United uh, States. Okay. You know, he, 
he he was a holdout. Um, so when he was captured, he was originally sent to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio. And then from there, after six weeks, he was sent to Fort Pickens in Pensacola, Florida. And the Washington Post wrote that in that alien climate, meaning Florida, the Apache died like flies at frost time. Oh, no. Yeah, very kind of ironic because it was a warmer climate than, than that. But, you know, they're yeah. basically saying that yeah. they weren't used to that. They weren't used to the humidity. They weren't used to probably the mosquitoes. They weren't used to all the things that Florida has that the West doesn't have. So a lot of the Apaches died in uh, Florida while they were being held. Let's face it. Pre-air conditioning, Florida must have been a miserable place. Well, I think Houston would have been a miserable place pre-air oh, yeah. conditioning too. I think about that all the time. I mean, yeah. it's just it's just un un almost unlivable, right? Unhabitable. Yeah, you kind of wonder how people did it for so long and you wonder if was it was it cooler back then? As a matter of fact, just a little sidebar. Do you feel like when we were growing up, summers weren't as brutally hot as they are now? Well, I grew up in Michigan, so they were never hot for me. And then when I moved um, to Texas, they seemed super hot. But I think you're right. I don't remember um, just the types of heat waves that we've had in the last, you know, ten years. I think you're on to something there. And if you talk to older people, they they tend to 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 say the same thing. Much more uh, temperate days. Yeah, like and, like you know, you'd have some days in the 90s, high 80s, low 90s kind of thing and now it's, you know, high 90s and low 100s pretty regularly at least in Texas. But I still think that pre-air conditioning, the people that settled these places and let's face it, they weren't wearing t-shirt and shorts either. You know, yeah. They wearing yeah. heavy wool sometimes. <laughs> see see the pilgrims episode. For more reference much, on that. Much hardier people, I think, um, than the wusses that live today. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. But none of them could operate a phone. You know, if, if we gave them a phone right now, they'd totally fail. So we got that going for us. <laughs> yeah. So while while um, Geronimo and, and uh, all the other prisoners that had been taken were in Florida, um, someone decided it would be a good idea to set him up as a tourist attraction. Because people had started to hear about them. I think his capture was big news. And so they started charging people to come in and put put lay eyes on the bloodthirsty Indian in his cell. Oh, that's awful. So was this like um, traveling uh, circuses would do this? Okay, so this is while he was being held in Florida was the first time they realized they could make money off of it. Then he was relocated back to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And he was actually given a plot of land and he was able to um, farm that land. They were, it, it was a prison camp basically, or a, or a reservation, but it was guarded so that they couldn't leave if they wanted to. Um, but during the train ride from, from Florida to F Fort Sill, Oklahoma, a lot of tourists wanted to actually meet Geronimo and they would pay him 25 cents to take a button off of his shirt or to touch his hat and so he kind of realized there was an economic opportunity here for him, and other people did as well. Well, he was into it. Well, I think it. I think it transpired over time as people started giving him money, and and he realized um, he he actually became for a Native American at the time became pretty wealthy towards the end of his life because of the fact that he was a celebrity. That's crazy. Remember, I said at the beginning he started off as a savage and a villain. And then later was a celebrity. Um, so they positioned himself, basically, they positioned him almost like a serial killer, you know, and calling him bloodthirsty and yeah. making him seem like uh, he was um, just a psychopath. Why did they soften their stance on him? They didn't really soften their stance. It just, he became a, a celebrity. So what happened is, like I said, in 1894, he was moved back to Fort Sill in 1898, he was taken to the Trans-Mississippi International Exposition in Omaha, Nebraska. And at this time, a lot of newspaper accounts about the Apache Wars had been circulated. So people were familiar with him and his name, and he became a major attraction at that exposition. And so he started to gain celebrity status and started to, to make some money and started to be shown at fairs. 
I don't think he was had a choice. He was a prisoner. He was still a prisoner of war. And so he was being taken to these things, but they did actually pay him. It was kind of, it was weird because like I said, he had a plot of land that he was given. Um, I, I don't think he was in a, like a jail cell necessarily, but I think he was kept under confinement for a long time. And then he was actually taken to the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York in 1901, and then even went to the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. He was always under guard you know, uh, of the army, and he was always made to dress in the most traditional um, Native American clothing they could put on him, right? The head headdress. And, and again, I think he was always positioned as a chief. Like people wanted to think he was the chief, not, not, a, not a shaman. And so this became something of a lifestyle for him. And, and, you know, I'm not sure if that was something that he was into or not, but he was making money. I think he was treated with more and more respect as his fame grew. And then he eventually became a part of Pawnee Bill's Wild West show. And he, again, it's it said in the article that he, uh, that Pawnee Bill brokered an agreement with the government to have Geronimo join the show under army guard. So it wasn't like they approached Geronimo about it. They said, Hey, this guy would be great in our show. And this show was one of these wild West shows where the Cowboys fight the Indians, literally Cowboys and Indians of old, right? So the Indians were made out to be, and I say Indians, native Americans, but they were called Indians at the time. They were made out to be savages that had to be tamed. They were uh, there to frighten the audience. They were supposed to frighten the audience and make the audience think that they would scalp them if given the opportunity. And people would pay to come and watch these shows where it was kind of almost like uh, the Lone Ranger, you know, where where the the good guys, the good white guys would ride in and tame the Native Americans. And uh, they were always then afterward given the opportunity to go over and touch the chief. And again, he wasn't a chief, but he was made out to be one. He was paid to be in these shows, but it's something that just kind of happened um, over time that I think he probably wasn't that into, who knows, early on. But, but you know, eventually you just get comfortable with it, I think. Yeah, I'm not okay with this. <laughs> this yeah, I really yeah, no, mean, tell- you know, story. Dirt Nap City is not all, Dirt Nap City is not all smiles and chocolate, you know, sometimes. Yeah, it's- yeah that's true. It's just the, the idea of um, making a freak show. Um, and then, but it's interesting that they paid him too. They yeah. I mean, I, mean, I was think- a prisoner. They didn't have to do that. Yeah. I'm not yeah, saying I- props to these guys or anything, but it's kind of weird. But it probably was easier to keep him, um, for, to get him to participate if they paid him, right? It probably, you know, if he, if he was more of a willing participant or at least not objecting and fighting the whole thing, it probably made it a little bit easier. Is my doesn't guess. sound like he was very free though, right? No, I don't think he was very free at all. So but I wonder then, what he did with this money. You know, where would he spend it? Well, uh, that's a good question. I I, I don't know. Um, that would be a good good follow up. Is where did Geronimo? That'd be a good uh, Google search. Where did Geronimo spend his money? <laughs> he 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 spent it all on uh, beads and fire water. <laughs> Okay, I gotta I gotta edit that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say hookers and cocaine. So uh, well, that was kind of that was kind of the that was kind of the thing at the time. Um, so get this: in 1905, he was so famous that he actually rode down Pennsylvania Avenue during President Theodore Roosevelt's inauguration, along with uh, four other Indian chiefs, Native American chiefs who wore full headgear and painted faces. And the idea, the the PR behind it, was that they were trying to show that the United States had buried the hatchet forever with the Native Americans, that everybody was good. You know, so they were really? they were put on display at uh, Teddy Roosevelt's inauguration in 1905 to to kind of make it seem like they had been at peace. And it was such a big crowd. That was another place where kind of in the East and um You know, at a national level, he became more of a celebrity. After that, after he rode in that inaugural parade, he actually got to meet with President Roosevelt. And once again, we're on to a Roosevelt here. They're reoccurring theme. Um, Background characters. And he he actually asked if the people that were being held in, in Oklahoma, 
and Florida and other places where the uh, Native Americans were being held as prisoners of war could be freed and taken back to their homeland and let them uh, live there. And Roosevelt actually told Geronimo that he had a bad heart. He killed many people. He burned villages and they were not good Indians is what he told him and uh, did not let him did not free those people. Wow. This is heartbreaking. All of this is heartbreaking. Did I assume he spoke English? Um, I don't know if he did because actually the next um, thing that happened in 1905, a guy named S.M. Barrett, who was the superintendent of um, schools or education in Lawton, Oklahoma, actually asked President Roosevelt if he could write a book about Geronimo. And so he uh, went to Geronimo and set up interviews and it's told it was told by Barrett and people who read the book and Geronimo himself that Geronimo came to these things with his own story, refused to answer questions, basically said, I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you, and told it from his perspective and spoke Spanish when he was doing it. And so oh, okay. uh, this guy Barrett had to have a interpreter from Spanish to English. So I don't know if he spoke English or not, but he apparently spoke Spanish and of course is probably his native tongue. But one thing... Um, that was said about the book by Barrett is that it was told from Geronimo's perspective. Barrett didn't change much. He kept it kind of the way Geronimo told him. Okay. That sounds like an interesting book. Well, and, and what's interesting about that to me too is, you know, I was going to say it was, you know, it was told as the truth, but I'm sure Geronimo's perspective was his own perspective, right? You know, the, the truth is always kind of in the middle of where everybody thinks it is. And so uh, it was told from his point of view. The, the main point was it was said to be an accurate depiction of what Geronimo told Barrett. So that was in 1905. And then in 1909, he was uh, actually riding his horse home late one night in, back in Oklahoma. And the he fell off the horse. And he was by himself. And he laid in the cold all night. And when he was found the next day, he was taken to the hospital in Fort Sill and died of pneumonia on February 17th, 1909. And on his deathbed, he said to his nephew that he regretted his decision to surrender. His last words were reported to be, according to his nephew, I never should have surrendered. I should have fought until I was the last man alive. Well, there's a story that six members of the Yale secret society called Skull and Bones. Now, have you ever heard of this secret society called Skull and Bones? I have, yeah. Many presidents and uh, yeah, famous bigwigs uh, were, were and, and su super secret. They never really talk about the initiation. Right, right. So, so Prescott Bush, uh, the the father of uh, George Bush Senior, was a member of the Skull and Bones, uh, along with five other people who all happened to have served as uh, volunteers at Fort Sill during World War One. So they. Um, were there. And then in 1986, a former San Carlos Apache chairman named Ned Anderson got an anonymous letter with a photograph and a copy of a letter claiming that Skull and Bones had stolen Geronimo's skull in 1918. Now that you say that, I remember this. I remember them talking about how Skull and Bones had Geronimo's head. Well, uh, it would have just been a skull by that point, right? But sure. um, had had taken it. So a group um, or an attorney for the Skull and Bones group said that uh, that was a hoax. It wasn't true. And several other people agreed with it. But what's interesting is they weren't able to... Um, well, in 2009, a lawsuit was filed um, on the descendants of Geronimo against Skull and Bones to return his to return Geronimo's bones to the, its proper burial place. But a military spokesman said that uh, there's no evidence to indicate the bones were anywhere but in the gravesite. However, interestingly, they've never been able to check because in 1928, the army covered the grave with concrete and a stone monument, making it very difficult to get in and see the remains. It's not like they can just dig it up. They would have to jackhammer a foundation and stuff. So, unknown whether skull and bones has the uh remains of geronimo or if it's still lying where it should be but that's up for debate it's right there in the name kelly skull 
and bugs. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So you were asking about why, or um, you might wonder why the um, paratroopers and people jumping off of things yelled Geronimo. Well, there was a 1939 film called Geronimo, and that was the inspiration. The U.S. Army paratroopers began the tradition of shouting Geronimo as they jumped out to show that they weren't fearful. And that caught on kind of nationally as anybody jumping out of anything would yell Geronimo. And so much so that there's actually a a paratrooper unit in the army in Fort Polk, Louisiana, that uses Geronimo as their nickname. It's kind of their squad name. But yeah, that came from the military paratroopers jumping out of planes to show bravery. Did you see the story? The uh, in Wikipedia, they have uh, a more detailed version of that story you just told, which is actually pretty funny. Can I can I tell yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, please, please. So it says, according to paratrooper Gerald Devlin, it's attributed to Private Aubrey Everhart. So he and some buddies were watching that movie Geronimo and um, went and had some beers and they were making fun of this guy and they said on the way back to the barracks, um, they said, you'd probably be too scared to re- remember the name of this movie when you're going to have to jump tomorrow. I think it was their first jump. And he said, all right, damn it. I tell you jokers what I'm going to do to prove to you that I'm not scared out of my wits. When I jump, I'm going to yell Geronimo loud as hell. When I go out that door tomorrow. Eberhard kept his promise, and the cry was gradually adopted by the other members of his platoon. There you go. Like some little scared guy uh, that was on a dare. Maybe they double dog dared him. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's interesting because, you know, that took over not only from the military, but then it became a pretty common thing for kids, right? Jumping off of uh playground Boogie or yeah. in, anything. I mean, you did did you yell... Or you knew of that, right? You knew it was a thing oh, when yeah. you were a kid. Yeah. Geronimo. I probably knew that before I ever knew who he was. It, it also kind of works because it's a long name and it has that O at the end that you can carry out. So it's Geronimo. You know, you can <laughs> you can really go with that. Like, yeah. I don't know that something shorter sense. would have worked. It makes more sense than Marco Polo game. Actually. Right, right, right. That, <laughs> that, Maybe we'll get into that in a future episode. So with all of that said, uh, you know, Geronimo still has repercussions today and an influence today. Obviously, people jumping off of things. People still, I think, mistake him for uh, an Apache chief, which he was not. But um, the in 2011, when the U.S. military actually uh, had the raid that killed Osama bin Laden, the code name for that raid was Geronimo. And there was a lot of uh, outrage among Native Americans that uh, it shouldn't be called that for a variety of reasons. And so they actually renamed it Operation Neptune Spear, but it was originally called Operation Geronimo. And then over the years, there's been uh, films. Stagecoach in 1939 was a film uh, that featured Geronimo. It wasn't about Geronimo, but Geronimo's uh, band was one of the raiders on the stagecoach that they had to defend off. So Geronimo was sort of a side character. Then there was a film also in 1939 called Geronimo. Um, and then there was another film in 1962 called Geronimo. And then there was a film in 1993 called Geronimo, an American legend. And in this case, he was uh, played by a Native American actor named Wes Studi. And then in... Uh, also in 1993, it's always weird when two films about the same thing come out together, you know, like uh, Bugs Life and Ants came out at the same time. You know what I mean? Um, Geronimo, uh, there was a biopic about Geronimo, and that one also had a Native American actor named Joseph Running Fox, and that was in 1993. I have not seen any of these films, but I actually intend to watch probably the biopic. I would be curious to see uh, what that's all about. He had to be one of the most photographed people around because the film was just starting. There's so many pictures of him. So interestingly, there's really not, but there oh, really? are there are probably about um I, I I did read this and I'm trying to remember exactly what it said, but it's like there was a photographer that was allowed to take photos of him 
And even before he was captured, like while he was still a uh, out in the band, and then also after he was captured, yes, he was photographed a lot more at that point. But there were like 12 famous photos of him before he was captured that actually uh, I think are shown a lot. There's one of him with the bow and arrow, and then there's several of him with the more uh, you know U.S. based weapons, the Winchester and all that th- things that I mentioned earlier. I guess you know when you're riding down Pennsylvania Avenue as part of the presidential inauguration parade, you're going to get your photo taken a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Even though it was 1905, um, a lot of that stuff, uh, I think photos were reserved for wealthy people and famous people. And and he's always a very old man when you see these photos too. Rich means that probably most of the ones that you're seeing are the ones taken after he became famous. Yeah, he's usually just sitting in a chair. Also, think about it, probably photography became more common later in his life, right? So it'd be like you and I, when was the first digital photo of either of us taken? You know, we were probably in our 20s or 30s before the first digital, you know, all that, all before that it was film. And so, um, you know, it's interesting when that transition happened. We probably didn't think much about it. Oh, like, here's this gimmicky little thing. It's a digital camera. What's that all about? Um, But when's the last time you had a film picture taken of yourself? It's probably been a while. Yeah, Yeah. probably funny how technology changes, but yeah, that is what I have to say about Geronimo. Um, Definitely be interested to hear what other people think. And again, you can email us at not at dirt nap city and uh, tell us what you think about Geronimo. If you have any other notes about the show, Alex, any final thoughts on Geronimo and his uh, exploits throughout the years? I think you summed it up at the beginning when you said that he was initially thought of as a bad person. And then over time, I think our stance on Geronimo has um, become more respectful and softened. And it's put into proper context of what he was really about and trying to do. And uh, I think his legacy has probably changed a lot over the years. But I think he's generally a pretty respectful respected person these days yeah i you know if 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 you try to think about it from the perspective of a person living in the united states in that time period the you know mid to late 1800s um you're just trying to live your life and you hear these stories about these bands of indians that are coming and killing people and you see you know you might even witness it and so he was terrifying to those people and that's understandable and from their perspective They don't see what they're doing wrong. But in hindsight, like you said, we get him more because we can empathize. We're not threatened by him today, right? There's nobody, there's no, no bands of Indians coming to kill us. And so for us, it's easier to look back and say, okay, we kind of understand where he was coming from. His land was being invaded, taken over, you know, and he was just fighting for his land, just like uh, probably a lot like what Ukraine's doing right now. You know, they're fighting for their land. And, and, uh, so. That might be a bad analogy, but I agree with you. I think he's become more respected as we've been able to put ourselves in his shoes a little bit more. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, he definitely fits the criteria of interesting people happen to be dead. I wanted to uh, start the year off by jumping into 2023 and yelling, Geronimo! (laughs) As we go. Well, Alex, thank you so much. Uh, Everyone, if you are a fan of the show, uh, know that we're back. We're going to be doing weekly episodes, um, most weeks in 2023 for season two. We've got a big one next week with Alex. I have no idea who it is, but um, you'll want to tune in. I'll want to tune in to learn it. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you throughout the year of 2023 on Dirt Nap City. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye.